Hey, this is Garrett Lynch with Nighthawk Equity. And today we're going to talk about a deal that we actually didn't do because of the things that we found during due diligence. Now, something like this is very difficult to go down that path because you're putting in a lot of time, effort, and energy and money into getting your due diligence done and into buying a deal only for it all to go away. And a lot of people get down the path and, and they don't actually move forward with a deal, but a lot of people also do move forward with the deal when they shouldn't. And that's what you want to avoid. So first, I'm going to go into what I really liked about this deal. There were a lot of things. The background on this deal is that it had been owned by a previous owner for about 30 years. Somebody bought it and they wanted to buy it with a bridge loan, upgrade the deal, and then flip out of it and sell it to someone else, which is a good strategy. It's a little bit tougher to pull off when you have a declining market. Like right now, we really like the location, a particular place in Georgia, there's a lot of of demand and not enough supply. Location is a really big deal when you're going into buying a property. You really have to look at the location. Our specific business plan in general is to go and find a junker property in a really good area and then bring the property up to the next level so that it's in high demand. Other things we liked about it, something that we had the tenant base on there that we really liked specifically. They were all paying on time. For the most part, there was very little delinquency on site, which is always helpful. So it, it allowed us to size is better on the loan. It looked like the property had been kept up and well-maintained and uh, the staffing situation had been figured out over there. So it'd be an easy transition to take it over if we were able to retain the staff. We had the choice to do due diligence on this site before we went under contract without any protections or after we went under contract with protections. We chose to do it without protections, meaning if the seller was misrepresenting the deal and we wanted to not do it, all the costs would fall on us for the due diligence. And due diligence does cost money. You have to get a team on site to go through every apartment to make sure that the deal is what the seller is saying it is. It can range anywhere from 5,000 all the way up to 15,000. Actually higher than that, 50,000, kind of the high. Ours was about 15,000, but it takes a lot of effort too. Like I had to fly all the way into Georgia. My team members coming from all over. We had about 20 people on site and we spent two days, two full days on site. For us to not do the deal, it's a very disciplined decision to make. So next, what I'm going to do is get into some of the things that we found and why we ended up not doing the deal, even though we liked all these things about it. The first issue that we found was something that we were already made aware of. We just had to, to cross check and confirm what was being told to us. There's a specific type of piping that if you find it in a property where you, it exists in the past, we've just run away from the entire deal altogether, but it needs to be addressed. And that type of piping is called polybutylene. Polybutylene piping is something that runs in the walls. It's your hot and cold lines. And it was something that was used in the 80s through 2000s in different properties. And it was used by developers because it was thought to be a really up and coming and great type of material to use for plumbing. Well, what they found at a later date was that this actually wasn't the case and that these types of piping that are made out of polybutylene failed often. They would burst in the walls where they were, the fittings were, they would fail consistently. And so you have a lot of damage that's happening to your property over time and just in general. And so those lines need to be replaced. And that's a very important thing. The previous owner knew about that and knew that their property wasn't going to be worth as much. They didn't replace these lines. So they started to do it, but they didn't just knock it out and be done with it. They did it slowly over time. They had a crew of two guys that went in, replaced each unit one at a time. So what I did is I already knew about this and all we had to do was check to make sure the amount of units that they did were done correctly. So what I did is I hired a local inspector that specialized in polybutylene. And then I hired a plumber that specializes in replacements. And what we found was that while about 70% of the units were replaced, they were not done up to code. So the previous seller before the one that had it now just instructed the guys to do it as cheap as possible, but it wasn't actually up to code. So if an inspector came, they would not pass it. That's the first thing we found. And we would have had to pay to upgrade all those units to get them up to code. The next thing we had to check for was the amount of units. And so we found that they were actually misstating the amount of units that had been replaced. There were additional units that needed replacement. In addition to that, the main lines were not replaced, which is another additional cost. So the next thing that we found was a lot, most of the HVACs 
20 or 30 years old, which is kind of rare when you find it, even with an older property, there's been replacements done over time. These guys were just set on fixing these things over and over again. So we knew that there was going to be a lot more replacements than we had initially budgeted for. We typically budget for replacements on site, depending on the condition of the HVACs. Well, there are a lot of HVACs that were all pretty much all of them that were classic, like some most 30 years old. And we didn't budget for that. So we had to add that into the budget and add it into a potential credit for the seller. And the last thing on the deferred maintenance side was fire code issues. So we found a lot of things on site that weren't brought up to code properly. And every year, at least in this state, there is a code inspection and most properties have this. You have to upgrade things to the latest fire code situation. And so we not only found that their upgrades weren't done, but there were additional issues with just the hydrants and things like that needed to be brought to code. This all costs money. But the final issue that we found, and this is a really good lesson, is we, I asked my construction team to measure the units to make sure that the unit size was what they said that they were. So my team measured them three times to make sure. And we found out that every single unit was two to 300 square feet off of what they were being told to us they were. And even what they were projecting them and, and selling them as to residents. So this is a big issue because if you add all of it up, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 square feet missing from this, what they told us was going to be on the property. So then it's like, okay, well, what do we do? How do we reprice this? Every deal has what's called a floor. And so even if there's no people living in the asset, typically your valuations are done based on NOI. So your net operating income. Well, if there's zero people in there, there's no net operating income, but that doesn't mean you pay zero for the property. It means that there's a floor. So it's still worth something, right? So, so then what we did is looked at the main issue, which is what's the real issue if you find less square footage? Why does it matter? You just can't command as high rents. And so if you have an oversized unit and you think you can get top of market rents, now you can't. Now you're right in the mix with everyone else. You can make it nicer. You can still get the decent rents, but it's not going to be the high, as high as we had thought. So we repriced it based on what we thought the updated rents would be based on what other rents in the market were sitting. That shaved about 600000 off the purchase price. So this is a decent amount. If somebody owned this for 30 years. Some guy bought it from didn't catch this, then we caught it because we were crossing our T's, dotting our I's and everything related to due diligence. So really he messed up when he purchased it from the 30 year old seller because you know that's it's a pretty big deal. And so the seller decided, you know, I'm going to wait for the market to turn and I'm going to see if I can sell this thing again when things get a little bit better, but I'm not going to do this deal. Sorry, we didn't want to put in our contract. We ate the cost, cost us $15,000. We ended up not doing the deal. It would have cost investors and ourselves a lot more if we had done the deal with all these issues issues. It was a tough decision. I, I want to do that. We hadn't at this point done a deal in about a year because of the market in general. So there was a lot of incentive to go forward, but we had to be disciplined. We had to make sure that we were doing the right thing for ourselves and for our investors. So we ended up not launching it, not doing it. May come back around, it may not. And I am completely comfortable with that decision. I hope you guys learned something about due diligence, the process. And if you guys want to find out more about what we do and see if partnering with us is in alignment with your goals, reach out to us at night equity.com click the join button join the investor club and just set up a call with us and let's have a chat and see if it's a good fit and in doing so you may find out that this is a great method for you to enhance your financial freedom and invest alongside the pros aka us that know what they're doing on this this front of the business not everyone knows this this takes a long time to understand how to go through this the right way so thanks so much we'll catch you guys next time